So welcome to this lecture on introduction to neural networks. So what I will try to do in this lecture is to give a self-contained introduction to what a neural network is. So that's the first part in this lecture. And then I will give one single example of an artificial neural network. So in the context of uh, data fitting. So what is a neural network? Well, let us start with what is a neuron. So it is a function depending on variables, also called inputs, and parameters. So the parameters w1, w2, wp are also called weights. So here you see a very simple function simple uh, neuron uh, called F with three inputs and one output. Okay, so here are two examples. So typically it is a nonlinear function. Um, you see here the function uh, explained for in both cases uh, for the number of parameters equals the number of variables plus one so we are taking in the first instance the weights multiplied with the inputs then summing them all up and then we have one additional weight that we then pass to this uh, tangents h function. Uh, the second example, the second example uh, may remind you to a Gaussian, uh, where we take the, again we have n plus 1 as uh, the number of uh, parameters, so we have n variables in general. Uh, we use the weights as the means and uh, the last parameter uh, kind of uh, plays the role of the standard deviation. So that's one neuron. It is a nonlinear function uh, bounded in output and it depends on parameters. Okay, so then what is a neural network? A neural network consists of several neurons and it is the composition of these nonlinear functions. So it is again a nonlinear functions, but then of two or more neurons. So here I took the example, you recognize here this uh, tanh h function. Here I have the uh, for one neuron, so the first index i runs over the neurons, so we have nc neurons in our network. Um, every neuron comes with its n plus 1 parameters here, but then there are also the extra parameters of the linear combination and then also the and uh, the last number. So we have a bold input vector, but now we also have uh, a double indexed weight vector. Complicated, let's make a picture. Here is uh, an example of a neural network. Uh, we have three inputs. Um, one of the inputs is called x0 and the x0 is just one. Um, it's called a bias. Uh, we have then, uh, here we have more layers. So we have the input layer and the output layer. But in between there are three circles here that represent the internal layer, the hidden layer. Um, so what the output does 
it adds the results from the hidden layers to the bias. Okay, so this is a network. We read this from left to right. Uh, if you like, it is a visual representation of a nonlinear function depending on many uh, variables, input variables. We will see that uh, for the output, we are actually not restricted to only one variable. A neural network can also return a vector of outputs. Okay, so uh, this comes in the context of machine learning. So sometimes if you look for machine learning, we introduced this in the last lecture, you kind of automatically end, uh, you automatically slide into neural networks. Um, here what is then the training of a neural network. Um, so it's an algorithm where you have the network given, but you don't know the values of the parameters. So the weights and the biases are unknown. So the task is then to train the network so that it will give the desired outputs. Um, so that's very abstract. Um, we, we, we will make that concrete in the example. So what we distinguish is between supervised uh, training uh, we actually either know uh, the nonlinear function analytically or we know what are the correct uh, values of the function. So if, we, if the neural network has to, if the desired result of the neural network is that it takes on specific values at specific points, then uh, if these points are given and known, then we speak of supervised learning. When the output values are not known, then it's up to the network somehow or the training to discover these uh, parameters. So the training uh, can be replaced by learning. So we made that distinction, one has that distinction as well with machine learning, supervised learning or unsupervised learning. So in the context of this lecture, we will deal with supervised training. Okay, so we can see this in the context of approximation. So we have a function of several variables. Uh, and we want to know, can we actually approximate any function? And there is an existence proof that actually says that, yes, you can do this. And even you can do this with a single uh, layer of hidden neurons. Like in the example uh, with the three inputs, one intermediate layer and then one output layer. So uh, the property that is here given. So at the end of the lecture, I will give references where you can find uh, that statement. Um, but the statement actually says that for any uh, regular function, that function can actually be represented or approximated uniformly and with arbitrary accuracy um, by a neural network. Now, if you design a neural network, uh, you can decide the layers, you can decide the number of neurons. Uh, it is uh, advantageous uh, to, and that's formulated as an optimization problem, to actually find the model, to find the smallest neural network that represents or that approximates uh, the function accurately. So there is a lot of theory that is there. 
uh, one can see uh, this is a course that follows numerical analysis. Uh, one can see that the framework from what we know from within numerical analysis can actually help us. Um, okay, um, let's look at an artificial neural network. Um, here it is a toy example. And in this lecture, I will consider only one example. So in this plot, we have 10 points. Uh, five of them are colored blue. The other five are red. Uh, so they represent success or failure. You can see this uh, region. So for X and Y, in between 0 and 1, you can see this region, so the horizontal x, the vertical y, you can see this region as kind of um, where you where some oil exploration took place. Uh, you have uh, places where the drilling resulted into something, and then you also have the failed uh, positions. So the question is, what we would like to do now is that we would like to decide where to continue our exploration. In a way, we would like to partition this uh, domain in red and blue dots. So one can also see this as a prediction process. So we have taken 10 samples, 5 of them were fine five of them were not, where should we take our next sample? Can we in some sense partition now this region into good and bad points? To make this very concrete, uh, so the first point closest to the origin was 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And for that, so this is a problem of supervised learning. We associate to that first point, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, the vector 1, 0. So the first five points that were colored in blue correspond to the labels 1, 0. The points that were colored in red correspond to the vectors 0, 1. So we have on input uh, the coordinates of the points. Uh, if you like, it's also a 2 by 10 matrix. And the labeling of the data points is also a 2 by 10 matrix. So this experiment that I'm going to continue is done with Julia. And you see that we are working within the context of uh, the 64-bit floating point numbers. And we can essentially also write this as an approximation problem. We are looking for a function in two variables so that for any point, for any point we find uh, the labeling. But the function, so you could also from numerical analysis, we can uh, formulate the multivariate Lagrange interpolation. And if it were just that, we could do this uh, already within numerical analysis. But it's kind of important uh, that in this course here, following numerical analysis, that we can uh, see the problem of uh, designing a neural network as also a data fitting problem. Okay, so what kind of functions are we going to use? Uh, we're going to use uh, smoothed step functions. Uh, they're called sigmoids. Um, here is their um, definition. So, and you can see that these are functions that actually turn off or turn on. Um, we were working with uh, either 1, 0, or 0, 1 vectors. Uh, so you can see the vertical axis here as kind of either the 0 or the 1. And you see that there is a rapid 
decay and actually a rapid increase to the limit. So it's a step function would give uh, zero all the way up to zero and one starting from zero. Um, here it's smoothed. Uh, you can make it a little bit sharper. So here is a scaled uh, and a shifted sigmoid. So it's shifted so that instead of zero, we have five where the transition is happening. And it is scaled in the sense that the function is steeper. So this to, this to indicate that for our problem, these sigmoids might be quite appropriate uh, to kind of these uh, switch off, switch on functions. So we will use the sigmoids in the neurons of the network. All right. Um, this is a computational lecture. Uh, so how can we represent this now uh, in um, a computational setting? So here is a simple Julia function that will evaluate the sigmoid function. Um, the terminology activate comes from neural networks. Uh, we have the parameters, uh, the weights and uh, the bias. Uh, so f and it is formulated in a vector setting. So the sigmoid, uh, so the pictures on the previous two slides suggested functions in one variable. The sigmoids actually work in any number of variables. Um, observe that when we evaluate the argument of the exponential, that we do this component-wise. Uh, so this function takes the dimension of the weight matrix, uh, so the number of rows in particular. Then the number of rows will be, must match the number of rows in the bias vector. So in, in a way this is a very um, loose implementation. So the function activate will not check in this. But you see here there is the plus that's happening of two vectors. The product of the weight matrix times the input. So the input must be a vector of size equal to the number of columns of uh, the weight matrix. Um, so in the bottom, uh, here you can verify this, what the dimension should be. If we have an n vector on input, then the W matrix will have n columns, uh, m rows, and also the output will have m rows, as well as the bias uh, matrix, uh, the bias vector. So that is kind of the minimum that we should still remember from linear algebra, how to multiply uh, matrices with vectors. Okay, uh, how do we build a network with this? Uh, well, here is our example network. Um, our function that we will evaluate will return a vector given the input vector x with six parameters. Actually, there are many more parameters, but the parameters are chunked up into three weight matrices and three bias vectors. And what this does, it calls the activate function, which computes the sigmoids evaluated if you like the scaled versions and the shifted version. So the bias is used like in the second picture for the sigmoid to shift the center, the natural center at zero to shift that away. Uh, the weights are used to um, scale uh, the sigmoids, either make them more steeper or make them more flatter. Okay, so we will work uh, with this uh, network uh, for our problem. 
we can visualize, we can uh, make a picture out of our network. Uh, so we have an input layer, uh, two variables x1 and x2. Remember these were the coordinates of the points, of the input points. And then for every input point we had the label 1001. So the 1001 vectors, there were the outputs. So that's the output layer at the very right. And then we have two hidden layers or intermediate layers. Um, so we have three uh, steps here. So the A2 is computed from the first sigmoid evaluation. And then the outputs are going to the inputs of the neurons on the next layer. Um, and then the outputs of the three neurons here go to the input of the last layer, the output layer. Now the x1 and the x2 are numbers. So what we do, the x here, we multiply this uh, with w2. So x1, two numbers, w2 will have two columns. But the output for the next layer here, uh, will we will need three uh, numbers. So what we will end up with, uh, we end up with a matrix that at some point has three rows. And then in the end we will have two and three, so a matrix of two rows, three columns. So looking at this picture here, uh, says something about also the dimensions of the matrices and the bias vectors. So you go from two inputs to three inputs here, from three outputs to two outputs. So that's also a way to interpret the dimensions m and n of these matrices. So n was the number of columns of our weight matrices, which is the number of inputs. The m, the number of rows in the matrices, are uh, the number of outputs. Okay, so this, uh, these matrices are actually unknown. Uh, so we know the coordinates of the input points and we are in a setting of supervised training. So we also know uh, the numbers, uh, all the values for Y1 and Y2 for every point, but we do not know the weights and the biases. So seems like a complicated problem. Okay, um, so in an earlier lecture on uh, introduction to machine learning, uh, I started out by saying that uh, according to some viewpoints, there is not much, there's not a clear boundary between statistics and machine learning. Um, perhaps I would not state it like this, but Statistics is extremely useful and comes in. Uh, so we will have here an optimization method that involves some random choices. Okay, uh, what are we looking for? Uh, we're looking for the weights and the biases in uh, this uh, neural network. Uh, we were defining a function if you like, uh, you can see these letters, uh, the A2 and the A3, as intermediate uh, variables, and we can eliminate them. So the function f of x, if we see it just as a function of x, then we can write it in nested form like this. So this is another representation, if you like, a more algebraic representation of the neural network. Uh, 
Now, uh, remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, have a function, a continuous function, uh, a nonlinear function using those sigmoids that represents, uh, that gives us the correct labelings for every point. So what we want is we want, uh, so the sigmoids are going to make sure that our function is kind of smooth. Uh, so I mentioned Lagrange interpolation that might not be, that might do the exact uh, interpolation at the points, but it might give you very strange results intermediately. So Lagrange interpolation, what we know from numerical analysis might not be a good fit here. Um, okay, so we can turn this into an optimization problem by saying that the computation of the weights, uh, the weight matrices and the biases uh, is equivalent of minimizing the expression here at the right. So we sum over all the 10 points, so the super index is not a power, uh, that's why it's uh, within these round brackets, we go over all the points and we consider the difference between two vectors. So this is a vector norm, a two norm. We consider a vector norm between what is given, the one zero and the zero one vectors, and what will be computed by this nested sigmoid. Okay, so this is the problem. Uh, the first exercise asks you to verify, uh, to justify that uh, this problem has 23 parameters. So the number 23, um, you can look back to the picture for the network and you can count uh, using the input the number of columns times the number of rows in every weight matrix. Added to that, uh, the number of elements in every bias. So the purpose of this exercise is here for you to reflect on the high dimensional nature of this problem. So we are looking for a particular function that depends on 23 parameters. So it's an optimization problem and one could, in theory, uh, write down all the partial derivatives, there will be 23 of them, and solve the system in 23 variables and 23 equations. What we know from the critical point method in calculus. That's not what we will do, or not directly. So in, 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 in a way we will get to something that is an optimum, or close to an optimum, but we will do this differently. And here is where an old friend uh, from numerical analysis, or from calculus, from calculus actually, is uh, very useful. So um, here, the problem is phrased as looking for a point in the parameter space. Uh, so the capital N, if we solved uh, the previous exercise, is 23. So we have a vector of length 23 and we have a cost function. And with Taylor series, so it's a nonlinear uh, problem, uh, with Taylor series we essentially reduce this to a linear problem. If we are willing to compute the partial derivatives of the cost function with respect to every component. So this is the multivariate representation, so the Taylor series in several variables, where we assume often that uh, the delta p is already small enough, uh, so that this linear approximation will suffice uh, locally. 
Uh, so we can, uh, we have here capital N uh, partial derivatives. We abbreviate this with this uh, gradient, with this uh, operator. And then we can write uh, that we can, the cost factor with a small step size is the cost vector at the point plus the gradient, um, the inner product of the gradient with uh, the delta p. Okay, so what we want to compute is we want to compute a step. Um, so we consider here actually p plus delta p and the p, so the cost at the current point. So the difference between is this inner product here and we want to have that the expression at the left is actually sm smaller um, so that much smaller here than the expression at the right. So we want this inner product to be negative. So we want to change, we want to find delta p such that we have the greatest decrease in the cost. Okay, so there is a, we're going, we started to phrase this as an optimization problem. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to minimize the cost function. That's the objective. So here we are in the terminology of mathematical optimization. And we will apply an iterative method for this. Uh, at every point, we will compute a correction term so that the cost function decreases as much as possible. It's like if you are in, uh, if you are hiking and you want to go to the lowest point as quickly as possible, then it, you're going to take that route that has the steepest descent. So there is a very nice geometric interpretation for this. Uh, we can make uh, that a little bit uh, more precise by estimating what is the change in the cost. Uh, so there is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality that says that the inner product of these two vectors here is bounded by the length of the vectors. So that means that if you want the cost to be decreasing as much as possible, then the delta P should be minus the gradient. So uh, the gradient actually gives you the upward uh, direction, but you go in the downward direction. So this gives rise to the method of steepest descent. Um, here, um, and here I'm skipping a couple of steps here. Um, so we will do this steepest descent. Uh, so there is a parameter that is determined a step size. So in every step we will determine a step size. Um, and that step size, uh, the value of the step size is called the learning rate in the context of uh, machine learning. Now, uh, the stochastic aspect comes in uh, by that the evaluation of the entire gradient vector in every step is actually too costly. So what we will consider is only one training point at a time. Uh, evaluate the gradient in that context. Um, so, and this algorithm is not a deterministic algorithm. So in every step, it will determine on which point you pick. So that's why it's a stochastic gradient uh, descent method.
Okay, so the second exercise is also to let you sink into uh, a little bit um, and eventually consult the literature that I will mention at the end. Um, so think about uh, why, if you do not like statistics, well, why would you really uh, be relying on these arbitrary choices? Um, well, suppose that you wouldn't. And perhaps for our application, for our example, 23 might not be that bad. Uh, you can also examine this uh, the solution of exercise 2 with respect uh, to numerical differentiation. So our parameter vector P consists of all the elements in the uh, weight matrices and the bias vector. Okay, uh, we have our method geometrically defined. Um, now it gets a little bit technical, um, and in some sense it's calculus, but then it may not have been that you've seen the evaluation of the derivatives in that way. Uh, so there is the field of algorithmic differentiation that essentially states that the cost to evaluate a gradient vector is proportional to the cost to evaluate the original function. Coming from calculus, uh, this is quite an important result. Um, now in calculus, one typically works with a small number of variables. Here we have 23 parameters. Um, so in calculus, in two or three variables, you can uh, not really be that worried about algorithmic differentiation, but it is important in actual optimization frameworks. Okay, so let us uh, introduce some notation again. So we have the a intermediate variables uh, so we say that the first intermediate variable is just the input and then we go up all the way up to a l so it's not a to the power l but the l stands for the level or the layer in the network so the little l runs from 2 to the number of layers in the network so the capital l will correspond to the output label layer so this is another way to formulate uh, the evaluation of the function that is computed by the network. Now we have a cost function. So we want to take the derivative of the uh, cost with respect to one of the components. Uh, so we are evaluating the um, function layer per layer and we can look for what is the how does the cost changing if we go at one neuron in one layer so there is the notation the partial derivative notation but then there is the interpretation for that number so the delta j at the lth layer is the error of the neuron the J neuron at that layer. And then comes some complicated formulas that actually require some uh, attention and some proof. I will indicate at the end where you can find this uh, proven if you are if you do not want to take these formulas for granted. Um, we are applying essentially the chain rule which we know very well from calculus and we start backwards uh, so we look at the very end uh, at the output layer and we compute the derivatives in each layer backwards it's here important to realize that uh, the sigmoids have quite convenient expressions for the derivatives so uh, this is also to indicate that uh, the cost to take the derivative of these sigmoids is actually the evaluation of the sigmoid and then 1 minus the sigmoid. So the cost uh, 
to evaluate that sigmoid is, is the derivative is again a constant of the uh, original function evaluation. And uh, by taking these formulas here for granted, uh, we can see that what comes out of there are actually the components of the gradient. So I think actually I so that's actually the punchline. So the last line gives the derivatives of the cost function with respect to the bias, with the coordinates of the bias vectors, and with the coordinates of these weight matrices. Okay, so this is what these uh, deltas will give us. So we can read this as the application of the chain rule, but this will actually this actually corresponds to an algorithm. Uh, so there are uh, in the algorithm what one does is one evaluates uh, the neural network. So we compute at each layer. So starting from the input layer, we compute the output at each layer the z values and then they get passed on to the next layer so at the end here the al is the output layer so that's the forward pass and then if we look for the components of the gradient we apply this chain rule and we work backwards. Uh, so starting at the output layer, all the way go back to the layer that comes after the input. So this is called uh, back propagation. Um, I think that in the terminology of algorithmic differentiation, it is called also the reverse mode of algorithmic differentiation. Okay, we are there. We have the algorithm. Uh, let's now look at the code. Uh, so the code fits on one slide uh, and it is documented. Uh, so we do uh, one million uh, steps. The learning rate is actually considered constant. Uh, so um, if you have seen uh, the gradient uh, method or in numerical analysis we have seen the conjugate gradient method uh, there actually the step size is uh, computed in every step so here in this implementation in the last step so there are here these six instructions in this last step we are essentially uh, applying the gradient so we have the current approximation that was the letter p for all the parameters uh, here we have the delta P multiplied by this eta. Um, we have one million iterations. So for every iteration, we pick a random component. So we have 10 points. Out of these 10 points, we pick one. Uh, one index. So what random returns is a vector. So I select a vector of one element. So I have to select it. I take the point. And the point is used in this forward propagation. And then we have the formulas that uh, compute these deltas. And that is done in this backward pass. What you recognize, or perhaps not, is that uh, the derivatives of the sigmoids. Uh, so we have the function value of the sigmoid. So the A4 is the value at the sigmoid. And then we have 1 minus the value at the sigmoid. So the derivative formulas for the partial derivatives in the backward propagation might have looked complicated. But here they are just summarized in these three lines of code here. Okay, so that's what there is um, on this example. And here then immediately the result. Uh, so uh, there is a Jupyter notebook that will be posted at the course website uh, where you can see the code executed. Um, and here is what the result is. So remember, or perhaps not remember, um, 
so the x1 were the first values of the points the x coordinates for every point the x2 were the y coordinates of every point so what is done here uh, the points are evaluated with the computed weights uh, and bias vectors and here you see what comes out of this uh, so as always this is numerical so it takes a little bit used to reading these numbers but observe that the first five points give you 0 0.99 so if i would have cleaned up this a little bit and rounded up and rounded here down so the 0, 0.0 uh, it's very close to zero so let's so you see that for the first five points i have one zero or very close to it and for the next five points i have zero one very good um so um notice that this is statistics and we are always quite happy when we can estimate something between a couple of decimal places correct um okay so one last plot uh so we i started out with making the plots of the 10 points so the 10 points are still here um so the successful points i now uh plotted in white and the failures are the black dots so all the dots that are in blue are the points where the first value y1 was larger than y2 so at these 10 test points or training points i have a very clear cut 1 0 or 0 1 what will be done for all the other points uh, when we evaluate our function f we will compare the y1 with the y2 if the y1 is larger than y2 the dot will be colored blue if the y1 is less than the y2 then uh, the dot will call it red so you see that this neural network classifies uh, the region so this region which is a square region but squeezed out a little bit uh, it classifies every point in the region according to the training points using the sigmoids okay um, that was an introduction uh, one very natural question is now one million was that really necessary um, well uh, i would invite you with this uh, third exercise uh, to plot the evolution of the cost function um, so this can happen in three steps uh, write a function that defines the cost function then adjust uh, the code for the training by in every step you evaluate the cost function the cost function at these weight matrices and bias vectors and we want to make a plot over how fast that network was actually learned was, was training how fast the training process went now uh, make a plot of the cost and then you can kind of see the shape um, so there are two random choices that are being made i forgot to point that out the initial weight matrices and the initial bias vectors are also picked at random so we start at a random point and then we in every step we make some random choices so along the way we uh, flip a lot of points but miraculously it, it works all right um, okay so i'm at the close to the 50 minutes uh, so for the definitions in this lecture i took uh, the overview chapter of the book of gerard dreyfus um, originally written in french but you can read it in english um, and the introduction to deep learning where i got the uh, artificial neural network from is from 
a SIAM review paper. Uh, SIAM so is the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. The SIAM review goes to all its members, so it's intended for uh, wide uh, consumption. So the purpose of this lecture is actually not only that you got an idea of what neural networks are, but also it's an invitation and encouragement for you to actually look into the literature. Okay, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for watching.